So in this chapter on management of neuropathic pain in the dog and cat, we're going to consider the drugs that inhibit prostaglandin and specifically the glucocorticoids, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and for the dog only paracetamol, which is often referred to as acetaminophen in uh, a country such as the USA. So why might we want to consider these drugs? Many people um, actually wouldn't think of using a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug for something that was affecting the nervous system because they associate these drugs with, as the name would suggest, reducing inflammation. And also these drugs are licensed for conditions with inflammation such as osteoarthritis. Well, we do have these inflammatory pathways in the nervous system and neural inflammation is a very important process in many CNS pathologies, uh, including neuropathic pain. And enzymes that are associated with production of prostaglandins, specifically the COX en enzymes, are localized throughout the nervous system, uh, specifically in the cortex, uh, in the dorsal horn, the ventral horn of the spinal cord, and the dorsal nerve root ganglion, of the peripheral nerve. Uh, we also have COX enzymes in the astrocytes, which are the, uh, some of the supporting cells of the nervous system, and in the microglia, which are very important in uh, neuroinflammation. And many processes are involved in activation of these enzymes, in particular, uh, NMDA receptor activation. And as, as those of you who are aware of the bio uh, neurology of pain will know that NMDA receptor activation is a very important uh, process. And this will operate, regulate the neuronal COX2 um, and microglia also exhibit the other uh, COX variant, which is uh, COX1. What is COX? It is the cyclooxygenase uh, enzyme that is involved in uh, conversion of arachnidonic acid to the prostaglandin. So other things that are very important is that um, uh, after you get a traumatic injury, uh, COX-2 is upregulated and, uh, and, and COX-2 activated prostaglandin E2 lowers the threshold for neuronal depolarization will increase the number of action potentials and repetitive spiking. So this is a good thing to try to inhibit. Um, and very importantly, the actions of COX-2 will contribute to neuronal plasticity and also increase central sensitization. And if these processes are a little bit foreign to you, then I suggest the video on the neurobiology of pain. So. These are actually very valid processes for reducing in, um, uh, in when we're trying to manage neuropathic pain. So I'm going to go through them individually and starting at the start of the cycle. So first of all, we have the, um, the, the, these molecules all come from phospholipids, which are the small lipid molecules in the cell membrane. And these are converted um, by phospholipase to arachnidiolic arachnidonic acid and these are inhibited by the glucocorticoids. Now I do not uh, advocate using glucocorticoids in many neurological diseases. Um, I'm certainly not a fan of the old vitamin P or prednisolone and I'm very much against blanket use of them just because it's a neurological problem. I will specifically use them in um, in diseases of the brain that involve a lot of inflammation, such as um, the uh, meningoencephalomyelitis of unknown origin, although I will uh, always use those with a glucocorticoid sparing agent. Uh, that's a subject for another lecture. But in neuropathic pain, I will use them in uh, two circumstances. The first is by delivering them locally. That means if you deliver them locally, you get to the target organ and uh, you don't get those systemic side effects or not as much. And the most common means that I will do that is by giving epidural uh, uh, methylprednisolone, uh, specifically uh, for lumbar sacral disc disease and nerve root impingement. 
and glucocorticoids will switch off uh, quite a lot of genes as, as well as um, uh, deactivating phospholipase. So it can be quite useful in that context. And I will also use glu uh, glucocorticoids, uh, specifically prednisolone, uh, when I'm treating a traumatic injury to a peripheral nerve, because um, as I've said before, uh, this will um, upregulate uh, COX-2 and, um, and prostaglandin production. And I will use that very specifically and for a short course. I really want to concentrate this discussion on the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And I use these as an add-on um, agent when managing neuropathic pain. So, uh, for example, in treating Chiari malformation and syringomyelia, uh, the gabapentinoids, pregabalin and gabapentin, are very much my first and second line agent. But I will often add a uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drug to that uh, medication. What's the reason for that? Well, first of all, managing neuropathic pain, as I've said before in, in, in the lectures on this on YouTube is a little bit like stopping sheep escaping from a field. You can shut the gate with gabapentin, but if they're all jumping over the fences, then we're still going to get pain. So using polypharmacy can be uh, more effective than simply doubling the dose of the original drug. And of course, doubling the dose of the original drug also doubles the side effects. And the non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs have the advantage that they they don't cause much sedation. There is some argument that um, they can cause some sleepiness, um, but that is extremely minor. And actually, it probably is that they improve sleep in the animals that have them. And, um, and the also argument is that they don't stimulate the appetite. So I would suggest that you use these drugs um, when appropriate. Obviously, they do have their own adverse effects, uh, including gastrointestinal um, um, set and the possibility of affecting the uh, COX inhibitors in the kidney as well. Um, and so you must make yourself aware of that and also monitor for that, for example, doing uh, uh, periodic serum biochemistry and hematology. We can either use the selective COXIB2 inhibitors, which can be, in my experience, very effective. And some of these drugs being the very uh, early drugs that uh, were developed for management of inflam inflammation, specifically osteoarthritis. These are often quite cheaper. Sometimes you can get better results with the highly selective COX-2 inhibitors. And this is because of the, um, the variants that are expressed in the brain and the, the spinal cord. Um, and uh, so I would suggest that if you haven't got a good result from one non steroidal inflammatory drug, that you change to another non steroidal inflammatory drug. And it has been showing, shown that switching it up, even going the other way, going back to a, um, a less selective COX-2 inhibitor can make a difference in pain management, that it seems that you can get tolerant to one non steroidal inflammatory drug after giving it for some time. Uh, the other drug that I very often use in the dog only, not for cats, it is extremely toxic and will kill cats, but in the dog, uh, paracetamol. Um, and this is an inhibitor of the COX-1 variant, which is um, very against neuroinflammation, so expressed by the microglia, and, uh, and also COX-2 variant, which is expressed in the brain and the spinal cord. And I don't typically give paracetamol on a, a daily basis, but this is often the, uh, the drug that we use to rescue uh, dogs. Um, and so when they're having a bad day, because neuropathic pain is not necessarily the same degree of pain all of the time. And sometimes there are bad days and it can be very helpful for uh, owners to be able to top up their medication with something like um, uh, paracetamol uh, to give them that little extra boost. If you're having to give paracetamol on a daily basis, I normally advise owners that that's when they need to get back in contact me with so that we can uh, uh, change uh, their daily medication to something that is uh, safer. I've never seen actually any problems with paracetamol 
at the doses that I, that I give them, which is the standard uh, 10 to 20 milligrams per kilogram dose. Um, however, uh, obviously, we all know that paracetamol does need to be detoxified by the liver. So uh, the cyclooxygenase converts arachnidonic acid to the prostaglandin, but there's another way that we can affect uh, prostaglandin in the nervous system, and that's to actually use a drug which is effective against the receptor, specifically the EP4 receptor, which is expressed in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and also in the dorsal nerve root ganglia. And there is also some expression in the uh, cortex. And as far as I'm aware, there's only uh, one drug that is available for veterinary medicine for that, and that is Rapiprant. Um, and it's, a, it's classed under the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, but it is a specific prostaglandin receptor antagonist. And the advantage of this drug is it's not affecting the COX uh, enzymes and so won't affect those COX en enzymes that are in the gut and the kidney. One, of the, one big difference with this drug, which I had to learn, is that um, a, often we give these, um, these drugs with food um, so that uh, we have less um, presumed impact on the gut. However, it's important not to give this drug with food as it can cause vomiting. So in summary, then, um, the arachnid uh, arachnidonic acid pathway is very important in the, in the peripheral and uh, central nervous system with pain. Um, uh, and it is uh, upregulated with a lot of neuropathic pain processes and using drugs that uh, inhibit that uh, is important uh, in your management of neuropathic pain. My recommendation is that you use as specific a drug uh, as possible. However, there will be some circumstances where less specific drugs may be cheaper or just as effective. Uh, and some very um, uh, specific circumstances where there is uh, trauma to the nerve where uh, a local therapy with uh, corticosteroid or a very short term therapy, I'm talking days or weeks, uh, may be effective. Thank you very much. I hope that this has been useful to you.